Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Krishna C. Nadella, and this is State of Mind. We're here at Liz Prince Field here at McMaster University, and we have the privilege of speaking with Marshall Ferguson, McMaster grad and 2011 Vanier Cup champion. Join us as he speaks to us about the state of the student athlete. Marshall, thanks so much for joining us here on State of Mind this year. Thank you for having me. So, as a former student athlete here at McMaster University, yeah. talk to me about balancing your pursuits both prof professionally and personally. Yeah, I think uh, the world of sports media is an interesting one because, you know, everyone's life typically when they're outside of work is still sports because right. that's the reason that we get into sports media. And, and I think, you know, the balance that you have between is a lot of it's about kind of your mental health because, you know, the, the world of sports is constantly evolving. The world happens to spend 24 hours a day. I don't know if you guys know this, but <laughs> so there's games happening all over the world that's all right. the time. And so you can almost become too interested, too obsessed. And you got to be able to find that kind of personal balance of, I want to step away from the game. I want to ignore this. I want to take my dog for a walk. I want to watch the sunset, stuff like that, to get away from it. And that was originally something that I didn't understand. Like, I just thought, you know, tunnel vision. I got a job in sports broadcasting. This is what I want to do. I got to work hard. And, and you come to learn as you get a little bit older. And, you know, you talk to some of the older guys. They go, yeah, I just disappeared up to uh, the Corthas for the weekend with my wife. And, uh, and I'm like, did you see the Argos game? No, I, I have no idea what happened. And I'm like, so how do you do your job? They're like, I come back, I learn, I figure it out. So uh, there is definitely a balance between those two things. But it's, you know, being in school school I think was you know kind of taught you that if you want to do something well you can't just do that one thing you got to be able to find ways to kind of balance it all out. So let's take a step back go back to your yep. time here at McMaster. Uh, our show is broadcast in New York City but give our audience an insight what's it like to be a student athlete here in Canada? It's different. It is definitely different. You know, it's funny today, McMaster, their football team that I played on, uh, you know, I've been gone for two, three years now and uh, the guys are in, they're watching film and they're, you know, getting food from the coaching staff and they're going through what they did yesterday in a game where they beat the University of Toronto pretty bad. And it kind of took me back walking through the building to the fact that today's the first day of classes. Right. And it's also, you know, the first opportunity for these guys to break down film inside the stadium after one of their first games of the season. And so being a student athlete in Canada, to me is really all about understanding that it's not about ego. It's not about you. It's about a team. It's about finding balance. Again, it's such a key word when you're talking about sports in Canada because we are not on full rides and, and we are not, you know, with a, you're not going to have uh, people tweeting and texting and taking Instagram pictures of you every time you go out and you enjoy a drink with your friends. And we're not in that bubble. And I mean, like Zach Kalaros is the starting quarterback for the Hamilton Tiger Cats here. And I talked to him about it off air a couple of weeks ago because he was at the University of Cincinnati. And we went out, we grabbed a drink and had dinner together and I sat down with him and I said, you know, you're getting brought up by people all over the place in this restaurant who are coming up and saying, Zach, Zach, like, I got to get an autograph, I got to talk to you. And I, he said, nobody knows who you are. And I said, yeah, I don't really mind it like that. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, but you won like a couple of national championships when you were around the school and provincial championships and you were the starting quarterback for four or five years. And I said, yeah, yeah, nobody cares, right? And so he finds that very strange because he right. grew up in Steubenville, Ohio. He ended up moving to Cincinnati. He went to school. He was a four-year starter. He played for a major Division One program. And that perspective of the difference in, in, you know, I'm not important. It's about the team and it's about trying to accomplish something together. That's different. You get a lot of ego down in the States when you talk about this major Division One guys and the great teams in Division One football and really any Division One sport, D2, D3, doesn't matter. I find that they're able to put aside what their personal interests are and build together as a team. A lot of people look at the smaller size of Canadian university athletics and being a student athlete in Canada and say, well, it just means it's less important. I think it makes it special because it's ours. And, and a lot of people won't understand that who haven't played it or lived it. But, you know, every time that we get a game on national TV, you know, Christian, it's a big deal it's very big because deal. it's rare. And that's a lot of people want to celebrate that. And so I think that's different. That's unique. And that's it's kind of it's ours. And that's what separates it. So let's take a second to talk about yourself personally, even though it is about the team. What was the recruitment process like? Was there one? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, recruitment was fun. I think I, I might have squeezed it a little bit more than I should have by uh, trying to get some trips around the province to go see some different schools and things. There's, you know, there's so many factors that go into it. For me, it was kind of a balance between academics. I originally wanted to go into kinesiology and become kind of, I wanted to be around sports and I didn't know how. Uh, not smart enough to be a doctor, a Cairo, anything like that. So I just thought, oh, I'll be a gym teacher. I'll coach kids and I'll kind of give back in the way that I was given back when I was developing as a football player. But um, so I was thinking about school. Uh, I was thinking about location as well. I'm from Kingston, Ontario originally. So uh, I didn't want to, you know, be out in Saskatchewan or Regina, never see my parents, never have them come to a game. So that meant something to me. Um, the actual campus environment is, I know you've traveled to so many now that you can tangibly feel 
when you drive or you walk or you bike onto a campus what the vibe is, Absolutely. right? And you know the difference when you get to a campus, whether this feels like home or this feels like some place that I might not fit into. And it's not necessarily, you know, age or demographic or the size of the buildings or it's just a feeling. Yep. And so, you know, I came to McMaster and I was walking around campus and I'm like, it kind of feels like I'm walking around in my backyard and there just happens to be places where I'm going to go to school. And so I think that was unique, but it, it came down to those three big factors for me when it was about feel of the campus, academics, and also location. So you had mentioned about athletic scholarships and how they're not offered in the conventional yeah. sense here in Canada. Talk to me about that because when I went to school, it was only academic scholarships. Yeah, and there's a bit of a misnomer on Canadian athletics where it's just, oh no, there's no money. Right? And there's no chance for you to get that. They have a certain allotment of scholarships that are available for Canadian student athletes. So basically what happens is the maximum scholarship when I came in, I believe it was $3,000. And again, people watching this from the States will laugh at that because that's not even your books, right? right. So, but you think about it, it's around $3,000 when I came in. By the time I was in second year, it was 3,500. Then it got bumped to 4,000 and I believe it's 4,500 now. So in the last five years alone, it's gone up exponentially. And I think that that's a really good sign for what's happening in Canadian university athletics is we're putting important on saying if you want to keep your best athletes inside the country and you want to have great national stories to tell and the stories are what really build the sport then you have to be able to pay the kids to be able to keep them to be able to offer them things that really mean to them mean something to them so um, I was lucky because I played quarterback that I was a guy that they labeled as a max player which meant that you know inside that scholarship allotment if they have sixty thousand dollars worth of scholarships throughout the entire athletic department and again people in the states will laugh at 60 grand for the entire apartment because I know it's around 80,000 for a one year full ride kind of thing but um, but you think about, you know, I was a max guy, which means no matter what the maximum is that's allowable by Canadian university sport, right. I was going to get that. And there are other players who are partial. And so that means, you know, we're going to offer you $500 or we're going to offer you a bursary or we're going to get you work or things of that nature. And so you kind of, you know, look at the football team, they're going to have the most maximum scholarships, obviously, in Canada because it's the big money sport here, regardless of, of what people think. We don't even have a hockey team, by the way, on campus for people that are wondering yeah, about. Right. Yeah, which is something that a lot of people would say, wow, obviously, because you think about the Frozen Four down exactly. in the States, it's a celebration of the Northeast. Okay, we're in the Northeast. Yeah. We don't even have a hockey team that plays in the OUA. So exactly. uh, it is a bit different. But yeah, so there's max guys, there's partial scholarship guys. And then uh, if you get labeled as a max guy, you are a max guy throughout. It's not one of those spots where they can pull your scholarship. Uh, as long as you're on the team, you're contributing and you're active in the community, which is a big part of playing here as well, then you're going to stay a max player. And your GPA is very important too. The academic yeah. success is really something that the university counts on you to maintain. Yep. You have to have a 75, I believe, at McMaster. It's different per schools, right. but a 75 at McMaster uh, to be able to get into school and to be eligible for a scholarship. Uh, and I believe you have to hold an 80% once you're actually in school to maintain your scholarship. So not only are you, you know, you can be a max player. Yep. If you're a max player with a 78, you're not a max player. Right? And then that changes your whole aspect of, of deciding where to go to school, which again influences your recruiting process. And that means that you have to actually stay on top of things, which again, it's, you know, I saw a tweet the other day, Johnny Menzel goes back to Texas A&M for an opportunity. And they said, they're going, he's going back to class. And everybody said, well, there's the first time for everything, <laughs> right? He was there last time. I don't think he was going to many classes. So uh, it's all different for everybody. I had a friend who actually played receiver here at McMaster, who named Jared Jones. And uh, he ran track at the University of Memphis when Derrick Rose was there. Oh, right? And he said, I, I saw Derek Rose just sitting on lawns every day for about 10 hours. He would go to practice, he would lay down, he'd take a nap in the middle of campus and hang out with some of his friends and stuff. So it is different from place to place to place. But in Canada, like I say, it, congrats, you're a max guy. Yeah. If you're not at 80, it doesn't matter. Just remember, folks, watching grass grow is not max. <laughs> that's, that's, true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, <laughs> to the best of your abilities, what are the similarities and differences that you saw between the Canadian approach to college athletics, university athletics, yeah. and American college athletics? Uh, in terms of the actual approach from the, uh, the, uh, the athletic side, yeah, so the athletic side to me, the biggest difference is that we are not the show, right? And it's, it's almost like when you're talking about minor league baseball versus major league baseball, major league guys, you know, the music, the, the walk up intros and everybody's a star and right. you go down to double A and they're, they don't have, they have a per diem of $60 right. per day. They're, they're on a, bus. they're on a bus for yeah. 14 hours to get to their next game. Then they're playing three games in two days. Right. Like it's. It's, it's kind of like that if you want to compare U.S. and Canada where it's so much smaller, the scale is shrunk down. I mean, yesterday, again, McMaster's football team played a football game against the University of Toronto. University of Toronto has struggled in the last couple of years, but that game was played at Tim Hortons Field. That place holds 25,000 people or so. They promoted the game like crazy. They tried to get everybody out to it, and they really wanted it to be at least 10, 15,000 people. You know, you're getting 60, 70, 110,000 at Michigan, all of that for a big right. game. Even it, it, I mean, Michigan played Hawaii yeah. this past week, That's and right. they had 110,000 people there because it's Michigan football, and why not? Yeah. 
McMaster plays in their own city at a big stadium with lots of alumni around on Labor Day weekend here, they got 6,000 people out. And so that I think gives a good kind of perspective on the fact that the following is here. People love the game. They really do appreciate the efforts of everybody who builds up the programs. The coaches are paid, paid a fair salary. The players are paid in scholarships the way that they should be to try and get their secondary, post-secondary education and all of that. But it's just so much shrunk down uh, that it does make it difficult to put into perspective, you know. And you talk to guys like I do for my job now covering the Tiger Cats where I see, you know, Tommy Streeter is a receiver who's bounced around the NFL. He's from the University of Miami and he comes up. And people say, well, what could Tommy Streeter possibly be for this Tiger Cats football team? You know, will he be able to uh, work under pressure? I'm like, that guy's played in the Orange Bowl in right. front of 80,000 people 40 times. That's right. Like, he's going to play in front of 25,000 people in a Canadian football league game? I think he'll be okay, right? right? And so that, that perspective of growing up throughout the sport and staying in the sport your whole life and being in a different country that treats it differently definitely affects the, the kind of the end game of where you end up as a player. Now you had mentioned about keeping the talent here in Canada. Yeah. Uh, I have to imagine you had consideration for Division 1, Division 1 AA, Division 2, Division 3. Why did you stay in Canada? Um, I'm, I'm uh, maple blooded through and through. I think that's, that's a big thing for me is you know, I take great pride in the fact that if you can be great at what you do and you can do it locally and you can do it for people who care about who you are and what you are, I think doing, you know, we've seen the NBA free agency, everybody's just going home, right? right? That's all people want to do. Dwayne Wade goes back to Chicago, LeBron goes right. back to Cleveland, like Kevin Durant was rumored to be going to Washington. Yeah. There's a natural pull in all humans to want to, to want to do things at home for your people. Right. And I think that that was a big aspect for me. I, um, I never pursued that division two, division three angle. Uh, I didn't honestly see myself wanting to play American style football. I, I love the wide field. I love you know the slightly bigger ball. I love the three downs, the, the need to be passing, all of that. Um, I do know guys, I mean, Connor Pretty is the first name that comes to mind. He was a quarterback out of Markham that was my age. And I played against him in high school and I played against him in varsity football in the province. And I thought I was better than him. He went south, yeah. right? And, and so I saw him play a couple of games down south. Brandon Bridge uh, was a quarterback that was actually here at McMaster on this exact field behind us in the high school McMaster camp with me. And we were competing head to head. That guy was a gazelle, but I thought I threw the ball better. And I, that was all that mattered to me. I just right. thought, yeah, I, I could probably beat him head to head if we were playing with two teams of equal strength based on our skill set. He went to South Alabama. He went to Alcorn State. He was rated number 15 in the NFL draft prospects coming out this year. Didn't make it, goes to the CFL, bounces around in Montreal, gets released because he won't go to the practice roster, ends up in Saskatchewan now, and that's where he is as the third string quarterback. So yeah. it, everybody takes that different path. Right. And for me, I, I guess I'm a homebody, I'm boring, whatever you want to say. I, I had tunnel vision and I looked at Canada and I said, I want to pick somewhere inside the OUA where I can celebrate Canadian football, be a part of it and really grow within the game. And I know I keep saying grow within the game of football in Canada, but to me, the thing I love is, you know, Chris Cuthbert, calling games for yeah. 30 years on That's TSN, right. right? Like there's a certain Canadianity to being around the game of football where we're different, we're smaller, it's ours. We don't right. care. And yeah. we and we love that. And that's a little bit isolationist, I think. Sure. It's kind of like having, you know, a pickup hockey league in Alaska that you're right. very proud of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because everybody wants to kind of do it their own way. So that, to me, was the biggest part. So one of the things we've talked about on our show for the past two seasons, even recently with Glenn Grunwald and yep. President Patrick Dean, is mental wellness. And for you, I want to talk about mental toughness. Yep. You were in a situation where you were brought on board to McMaster. You were behind a legendary quarterback in Kyle Quinlan who won the national championship along yeah. with yourself. Um, but you had to ride the bench for a while. Yep. You had to pay your dues, kind of like, uh, I think the best analogy would be Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre of the yeah. Green Bay Packers. How did you persevere? What lessons did you learn? How did you make sure that you kept yourself up and ready at a moment's notice? I think a lot of it just has to do with coaching, to be completely honest. I mean, that exact high school camp I just told you about with Brandon Bridge and I competing, um, at the end of that camp, I'm walking off the field, my shoulder pads are off, and I'm just a dumb high school kid who was happy to be done camp. Right. And I'm walking off, and Stefan Patatsik, who played in the CFL, won three Vanier Cups as a coach, as a player, otherwise. Um, he was the head coach at McMaster at the time, and he walked up to me as I'm walking off the field. This is back in 2008, I think. And grabbed me by the shoulder and turned me around, which he's not a very forceful <laughs> guy. Turned me around and just, hey, how are, how are things? How are things? And just really, I could tell he was very interested in getting feedback from me. And I went, okay, this guy's really interested. Like, I knew they were interested because they invited me to come to the camp and they evaluate me and all that. But, and he said, uh, I've got a lot of quarterback options to be the backup to my starter. Kyle's going to be a very good player. And this is before the national championships. Right. This is before Kyle broke all sorts of school records sure. and CIS records. He just said, I, I really think that you are the guy I want to be the backup because I'm convinced that you'll be the only person 
who will actually work without playing. And, and he was right. Like I was, I was just kind of, again, in tunnel vision. I just wanted to play. That was what I loved. And so um, you know, when I think about you know, my decision to, to persevere through that, it didn't seem like persevering at the time because they created such a great environment for me where I was learning so much and I felt like I was still developing despite playing. And there's always that light at the end of the tunnel too where I'm going to get a chance. And, and I was always somebody who thought, I don't want to jump into something without knowing that I can accomplish it. And that might be, you know, the way too safe of an approach because I could have gone to the University of Toronto and been a starter day one based on what the coaching staff told me when I was being recruited. I turned down U of T being a starter right away because I went, what am I going to have around me? What's the vibe on campus? How am I going to feel in that locker room? Do I feel like this is home? And all of those questions that we talked about in recruiting. So um, the coaching created a really good environment for me to be able to persevere through that. Uh, and that mental wellness and talking about, you know, the, the togetherness of a locker room, I've never felt as I did in that 2011 national championship season with a group of guys. Like if we can, we can not talk for two, three years. Some guys I haven't seen go to a wedding this summer and see them, and it's like we're sitting in the locker room and we've been there for three years. And that's I think that's special because you don't get that on a lot of teams. So talk to me about leadership as a quarterback of a national caliber team. You have a lot of people looking at you yeah. to have the answers, and that parlays itself very nicely into the real world. How how have you handled all that stress? How have you handled pressure to be the one to take a group of people and put them in the right direction. Fake it till you make it. That's, <laughs> I love it. That's the best. That's what we're doing with this show. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the best thing you can do, honestly. There were a number of times where, you know, guys came to me for answers that I, they look at you for leadership. And it's, it's one of those interesting moments where you know that people are looking for you for guidance and you know you don't have the answers all the time. You don't say that. You don't, you don't act like you do, right? And so you just kind of take it all in and say, yeah, here we go. Let's do this. Follow me. And you act like you have an understanding of what's going on and that you have control of the situation. And then if you end up turning out correctly, then, hey, you look like a leader, right? Like, and, right, there, right. and there's different forms of leadership. There are guys who will talk at the side of their mouth for weeks and years and years, and then they won't have that leadership moment where they actually execute and get what they need done. But to me, I was, I was a quieter guy until I got to that leadership role because I felt like there was a void. The one thing I will say, in 2013, it was my first year starting after three years of being a backup. Kyle Quinlan had graduated and left, and he was actually the running backs coach. I felt that void was there, and I felt, i got to be a leader, because Kyle was a leader. I'm a quarterback. He was a quarterback. I have to be the leader of this team. And it was almost forced. Forced leadership never works. Whether it's a new coach coming in and stilling his will on a team, or whether it's a quarterback who decides that he has to step up and start being more and more vocal, I felt like what I was saying in 2013 fell on deaf ears because that was just me trying to fill a void and everybody went, okay, he's the quarterback. Yeah, we get it. You're new. You're the starter. Yeah, you can. In 2014, it was genuine because right. we had actually grown together and guys understood, listen, I'm, I have all of your best interests at heart yeah. and I want to be able to actually do this together. My, one of my favorite moments, a uh, quick little story of uh, kind of learning leadership and, and feeling that pressure that you're talking about. In 2011, Kyle Quinley got suspended by the school uh, for an off-field incident and I didn't know about it. Not a lot of guys in the room knew about it. We didn't know about the suspension. All we got told, you know, after a Saturday evening was on Monday afternoon uh, that the athletic director at the time, Jeff Giles, would be coming down and speaking to us in the locker room. And we had all heard rumblings, something was going on, but we didn't know what. And we had just come off a game right here at McMaster against Western Arrivals, and they had beat us up 52 to 9. Tyler Varga, who was in the NFL uh, just until last year when he retired, he had gone for you know, 400 yards and five touchdowns and all that stuff. So we had a, a terrible crushing defeat. Our quarterback had done something crazy that a lot of us didn't really know exactly what the specifics were. And I was the backup quarterback. At the time, I'm in my second year. I'm like 18, 19 years old kind of thing. Athletic director walks into the locker room, place goes dead silent. And he just basically says, guys, there's been an incident off campus. Uh, we had to make a decision as an athletic department for the best of the school and for the message that we'll send to you in the future. Uh, your starting quarterback has been suspended for three weeks. And I'm, you know, second year guy, hiding in the back of the room, trying to look over right. the offensive lineman to see what's <laughs> going on. And all of a sudden, I feel 70 sets of eyes do this. Oh. And look at me in the back of the locker room, right? right. And so they turn around and stare at me, and I'm just kind of like, hi, yeah, I'll be your starter. It's nice to, <laughs> nice to meet you guys. So, and that, that moment I will never forget because it was like some guys were clearly doing it just like, oh my God, Marshall has to start. And right. some other people were looking at me and saying, 
Like they, they, you could tell they didn't want to put that pressure on me, but they were doing this. They're, and I am like, I can still see your eyes. I can see you looking at me. So that, right. that pressure, that's that one singular moment where I remember that's what this is all about. Well, listen, Marshall, we appreciate the time. You've been great on the Thank show. Thank you. All the best with the Ticat season and with McMaster Marauders football. And uh, if there's anything we can do, how can our viewers get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter at TSN underscore Marshall. Also got a website, MarshallFerguson.com, where I throw up all my work for CFL.ca, TSN, otherwise, and love uh, also involved with the SPCA. So if you're around your SPCA, get involved with them, volunteer, because that's a big uh, cause that I love getting a part of. Sounds great. Thanks so much. That'll wrap up our show for today. If you like what you saw in today's episode, please feel free to like, share, comment, and subscribe on the various social media platforms at the bottom of your screen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. And remember, every life is a book. Make yours a bestseller. Have a good night.